This is the Bhaktivedanta Vedic Library. One World, One Family, Inc. presents Sri Ishopanishad with Purports, 1974 edition by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Read by Damodar Invocation the personality of Godhead is perfect and complete. And because he is completely perfect, all emanations from him, such as this phenomenal world, are perfectly equipped as complete wholes. Whatever is produced of the complete whole is also complete in itself. Because he is the complete whole, even though so many complete units emanate from him, he remains the complete balance. Report. The complete whole, or the supreme absolute truth, is the complete personality of Godhead. Realization of impersonal Brahman or of Paramatma, the Supersoul, is incomplete realization of the absolute complete. The supreme personality of Godhead is Satyadananda Vigraha. Realization of impersonal Brahman is realization of his Sat feature or his aspect of eternity and Paramatma realization is realization of his Sat and Chit features, his aspects of eternity and knowledge. But realization of the personality of Godhead is realization of all the transcendental features, Sat, Chit, and Ananda, bliss. When one realizes the Supreme Person, he realizes these aspects of the Absolute Truth in their completeness. Vigraha means form. Thus, the complete whole is not formless. If he were formless, or if he were less than his creation in any other way, he could not be complete. The complete whole must contain everything both within and beyond our experience. Otherwise, he cannot be complete. The complete whole, the personality of Godhead, has immense potencies, all of which are as complete as he is. Thus, this phenomenal world is also complete in itself. The 24 elements of which this material universe is a temporary manifestation are arranged to produce everything necessary for the maintenance and subsistence of this universe. No other unit in the universe need make an extraneous effort to try to maintain the universe. The universe functions on its own time scale, which is fixed by the energy of the complete whole. And when that schedule is completed, this temporary manifestation will be annihilated by the complete arrangement of the complete whole. All facilities are given to the small complete units, namely the living beings, to enable them to realize the complete whole. All forms of incompleteness are experienced due to incomplete knowledge of the complete whole. The human form of life is a complete manifestation of the consciousness of the living being and it is obtained after evolving through 8,400,000 species of life in the cycle of birth and death. If in this human life of full consciousness the living entity does not realize his completeness in relation to the complete whole, he loses the chance to realize his completeness and is again put into the evolutionary cycle by the law of material nature. Because we do not know that there is a complete arrangement in nature for our maintenance, we make efforts to utilize the resources of nature to create a so-called complete life of sense enjoyment. Because the living entity cannot enjoy the life of the senses without being dovetailed with the complete whole, the misleading life of sense enjoyment is illusion. The hand of a body is a complete unit only as long as it is attached to the complete body. When the hand is severed from the body, it may appear like a hand, but it actually has none of the potencies of a hand. Similarly, living beings are part and parcel of the complete whole, and if they are severed from the complete whole, the illusory representation of completeness cannot fully satisfy them. The completeness of human life can be realized only when one engages in the service of the complete whole. All services in this world, whether social, political, communal, international, or even interplanetary, will remain incomplete until they are dovetailed with the complete whole. 
when everything is dovetailed with a complete whole, the attached parts and parcels also become complete in themselves. Mantra 1. Everything animate or inanimate that is within the universe is controlled and owned by the Lord. One should therefore accept only those things necessary for himself, which are set aside as his quota, and one should not accept other things, knowing well to whom they belong. Report. Vedic knowledge is infallible because it comes down through the perfect disciplic succession of spiritual masters, beginning with the Lord himself. Since he spoke the first word of Vedic knowledge, the source of this knowledge is transcendental. The words spoken by the Lord are called aparashaya, which indicates that they are not delivered by any mundane person. A living being who lives in the mundane world has four defects. One, he is certain to commit mistakes. Two, he is subject to illusion. Three, he has a propensity to cheat others. And four, his senses are imperfect. No one with these four imperfections can deliver perfect knowledge. The Vedas are not produced by such an imperfect creature. Vedic knowledge was originally imparted by the Lord into the heart of Brahma, the first created living being. And Brahma, in his turn, disseminated this knowledge to his sons and disciples, who have handed it down through history. Since the Lord is Purnam, all-perfect, there is no possibility of his being subjected to the laws of material nature, which he controls. However, both the living entities and inanimate objects are controlled by the laws of nature and ultimately by the Lord's potency. This Ishopanishad is part of the Yajur Veda, and consequently it contains information concerning the proprietorship of all things existing within the universe. The Lord's proprietorship over everything within the universe is confirmed in the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, where para and apara, prakriti, are discussed. The elements of nature, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and ego, all belong to the Lord's inferior material energy, apara prakriti, whereas the living being, the organic energy, is his superior energy, para prakriti. Both of these prakritis or energies are emanations from the Lord, and ultimately he is the controller of everything that exists. There is nothing in the universe that does not belong to either the para or apara prakriti. Therefore, everything is the property of the Supreme Being. Because the Supreme Being, the Absolute Personality of Godhead, is the complete person, he has complete and perfect intelligence to adjust everything by means of his different potencies. The Supreme Being is often compared to a fire, and everything organic and inorganic is compared to the heat and light of that fire. Just as fire distributes energy in the form of heat and light, the Lord displays His energy in different ways. He thus remains the ultimate controller, sustainer, and dictator of everything. He is the possessor of all potencies, the knower of everything, and the benefactor of everyone. He is full of inconceivable opulence, power, fame, beauty, knowledge, and renunciation. One should therefore be intelligent enough to know that except for the Lord, no one is a proprietor of anything. One should accept only those things that are set aside by the Lord as his quota. The cow, for instance, gives milk, but she does not drink that milk. She eats grass and straw, and her milk is designated as food for human beings. Such is the arrangement of the Lord. Thus, we should be satisfied with those things He has kindly set aside for us, and we should always consider to whom those things we possess actually belong. Take, for example, our dwelling, which is made of earth, wood, stone, iron, cement, and so many other material things. If we think in terms of Sri Ishopanishad, we must know that we cannot produce any of these building materials ourselves. We can simply bring them together and transform them into different shapes by our labor. A laborer cannot claim to be a proprietor of a thing just because he has worked hard to manufacture it. 
In modern society, there is always a great quarrel between the laborers and the capitalists. This quarrel has taken an international shape, and the world is in danger. Men face one another in enmity and snarl, just like cats and dogs. Sri Ishopanishad cannot give advice to the cats and dogs, but it can deliver the message of Godhead to man through the bona fide acharyas, or holy teachers. The human race should take the Vedic wisdom of Sri Ishopanishad and not quarrel over material possessions. One must be satisfied with whatever privileges are given to him by the mercy of the Lord. There can be no peace if the communists or capitalists or any other party claims proprietorship over the resources of nature, which are entirely the property of the Lord. The capitalists cannot curb the communists simply by political maneuvering, nor can the communists defeat the capitalists simply by fighting for stolen bread. If they do not recognize the proprietorship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, all the property they claim to be their own is stolen. Consequently, they will be liable to punishment by the laws of nature. Nuclear bombs are in the hands of both communists and capitalists, and if both do not recognize the proprietorship of the Supreme Lord, it is certain that these bombs will ultimately ruin both parties. Thus, in order to save themselves and bring peace to the world, both parties must follow the instructions of Sri Ishopanishad. Human beings are not meant to quarrel like cats and dogs. They must be intelligent enough to realize the importance and aim of human life. The Vedic literature is meant for humanity and not for cats and dogs. Cats and dogs can kill other animals for food without incurring sin. But if a man kills an animal for the satisfaction of his uncontrolled taste buds, he is responsible for breaking the laws of nature. Consequently, he must be punished. The standard of life for human beings cannot be applied to animals. The tiger does not eat rice and wheat or drink cow's milk because he has been given food in the shape of animal flesh. Among the many animals and birds, some are vegetarian and others are carnivorous, but none of them transgress the laws of nature, which have been ordained by the will of the Lord. Animals, birds, reptiles, and other lower life forms strictly adhere to the laws of nature. Therefore, there is no question of sin for them, nor are the Vedic instructions meant for them. Human life alone is a life of responsibility. It is wrong, however, to think that simply by becoming a vegetarian, one can avoid transgressing the laws of nature. Vegetables also have life, and while it is nature's law that one living being is meant to feed on another, for human beings the point is to recognize the Supreme Lord. Thus one should not be proud of being a strict vegetarian. Animals do not have developed consciousness by which to recognize the Lord, but a human being is sufficiently intelligent to take lessons from the Vedic literature and thereby know how the laws of nature are working and derive profit out of such knowledge. If a man neglects the instructions of the Vedic literature, his life becomes very risky. A human being is therefore required to recognize the authority of the Supreme Lord and become his devotee. He must offer everything for the Lord's service and partake only of the remnants of food offered to the Lord. This will enable him to discharge his duty properly. In the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord directly states that he accepts vegetarian food from the hands of a pure devotee. Therefore, a human being should not only become a strict vegetarian, but should also become a devotee of the Lord, offer the Lord all his food, and then partake of such prasadam, or the mercy of God. Only those who act in this way can properly discharge the duties of human life. Those who do not offer their food to the Lord eat nothing but sin and subject themselves to various types of distress, which are the results of sin. The root of sin is deliberate disobedience of the laws of nature through disregarding the proprietorship of the Lord. Disobeying the laws of nature or the order of the Lord brings ruin to a human being. Conversely, one who is sober, who knows the laws of nature, and who is not influenced by unnecessary attachment or aversion, 
is sure to be recognized by the Lord and thus become eligible to go back to Godhead, back to the eternal home. Mantra 2 One may aspire to live for hundreds of years if he continuously goes on working in that way, for that sort of work will not bind him to the law of karma. There is no alternative to this way for man. Purport No one wants to die. Everyone wants to live as long as he can drag on. This tendency is visible not only individually, but also collectively in the community, society, and nation. There is a hard struggle for life by all kinds of living entities, and the Vedas say that this is quite natural. The living being is eternal by nature, but due to his bondage in material existence, he has to change his body over and over. This process is called transmigration of the soul or karma bandhana, bondage by one's work. The living entity has to work for his livelihood because that is the law of material nature. And if he does not act according to his prescribed duties, he transgresses the law of nature and binds himself more and more to the cycle of birth and death in the many species of life. Other life forms are also subject to the cycle of birth and death, but when the living entity attains a human life, he gets a chance to get free from the chains of karma. Karma, akarma, and vikarma are very clearly described in the Bhagavad Gita. Actions that are performed in terms of one's prescribed duties, as mentioned in the revealed scriptures, are called karma. Actions that free one from the cycle of birth and death are called akarma. And actions that are performed through the misuse of one's freedom and that direct one to the lower life forms are called vikarma. Of these three types of action, that which frees one from the bondage to karma is preferred by intelligent men. Ordinary men wish to perform good work in order to be recognized and achieve some higher status of life in this world or in heaven. But more advanced men want to be free altogether from the actions and reactions of work. Intelligent men well know that both good and bad work equally bind one to the material miseries. Consequently, they seek that work which will free them from the reactions of both good and bad work. Such liberating work is described here in the pages of Sri Ishopanishad. The instructions of Sri Ishopanishad are more elaborately explained in the Bhagavad Gita, sometimes called the Gita Upanishad, the cream of all the Upanishads. In the Bhagavad Gita, the Personality of Godhead says that one cannot attain the state of Naishkarmya, or Akarma, without executing the prescribed duties mentioned in the Vedic literature. This literature can regulate the working energy of a human being in such a way that he can gradually realize the authority of the Supreme Being. When he realizes the authority of the Personality of Godhead, Vasudev, or Krishna, it is to be understood that he has attained the stage of positive knowledge. In this purified stage, the modes of nature, namely goodness, passion, and ignorance, cannot act, and he is able to work on the basis of naishkarmya. Such work does not bind one to the cycle of birth and death. Factually, no one has to do anything more than render devotional service to the Lord. However, In the lower stages of life, one cannot immediately adopt the activities of devotional service, nor can one completely stop fruitive work. A conditioned soul is accustomed to working for sense gratification, for his own selfish interest, immediate or extended. An ordinary man works for his own sense enjoyment, and when this principle of sense enjoyment is extended to include his society, nation, or humanity in general, It assumes various attractive names, such as altruism, socialism, communism, nationalism, and humanitarianism. These isms are certainly very attractive forms of karma bandhana, karmic bondage, but the Vedic instruction of Sri Ishopanishad is that if one actually wants to live for any of the above isms, he should make them God-centered. 
There is no harm in becoming a family man or an altruist, a socialist, a communist, a nationalist, or a humanitarian, provided that one executes his activities in relation with Ishavasya, the God-centered conception. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna states that God-centered activities are so valuable that just a few of them can save a person from the greatest danger. The greatest danger of life is the danger of gliding down again into the evolutionary cycle of birth and death among the 8,400,000 species. If somehow or other a man misses the spiritual opportunity afforded by his human form of life and falls down again into the evolutionary cycle, he must be considered most unfortunate. Due to his defective senses, a foolish man cannot see that this is happening. Consequently, Sri Ishopanishad advises us to exert our energy in the spirit of Ishavasya. Being so engaged, we may wish to live for many, many years. Otherwise, a long life in itself has no value. A tree lives for hundreds and hundreds of years, but there is no point in living a long time like trees, or breathing like bellows, or begetting children like hogs and dogs, or eating like camels. A humble, God-centered life is more valuable than a colossal hoax of a life dedicated to godless altruism or socialism. When altruistic activities are executed in the spirit of Sri Ishopanishad, they become a form of karma yoga. Such activities are recommended in the Bhagavad Gita, for they guarantee their executor protection from the danger of sliding down into the evolutionary process of birth and death. Even though such God-centered activities may be half-finished, they are still good for the executor because they will guarantee him a human form in his next birth. In this way, one can have another chance to improve his position on the path of liberation. How one can execute God-centered activities is elaborately explained in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu by Srila Rupa Goswami. We have rendered this book into English as The Nectar of Devotion. We recommend this valuable book to all who are interested in performing their activities in the spirit of Sri Ishapanishad. Mantra 3. The killer of the soul, whoever he may be, must enter into the planets known as the worlds of the faithless, full of darkness and ignorance. Purport. Human life is distinguished from animal life due to its heavy responsibilities. Those who are cognizant of these responsibilities and who work in that spirit are called suras or godly persons. And those who are neglectful of these responsibilities or who have no information of them are called asuras or demons. Throughout the universe, there are only these two types of human being. In the Rig Veda, it is stated that the suras always aim at the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord Vishnu and act accordingly. Their ways are as illuminated as the path of the sun. Intelligent human beings must always remember that the soul obtains a human form after an evolution of many millions of years in the cycle of transmigration. The material world is sometimes compared to an ocean, and the human body is compared to a solid boat designed especially to cross this ocean. The Vedic scriptures and the acharyas, or saintly teachers, are compared to expert boatmen, and the facilities of the human body are compared to favorable breezes that help the boat ply smoothly to its desired destination. If, with all these facilities, a human being does not fully utilize his life for self-realization, he must be considered atmaha, a killer of the soul. Sri Ishopanishad warns in clear terms that the killer of the soul is destined to enter into the darkest region of ignorance to suffer perpetually. There are swine, dogs, camels, asses, etc., whose economic necessities are just as important to them as ours are to us. But the economic problems of these animals are solved only under nasty and unpleasant conditions. The human being is given all facilities for a comfortable life by the laws of nature, because the human form of life is more important and valuable than animal life. 
Why is man given a better life than that of the swine and other animals? Why is a highly placed government servant given better facilities than those of an ordinary clerk? The answer is that a highly placed officer has to discharge duties of a higher nature. Similarly, the duties human beings have to perform are higher than those of animals, who are always engaged in simply feeding their hungry stomachs. Yet the modern soul-killing civilization has only increased the problems of the hungry stomach. When we approach a polished animal in the form of a modern, civilized man, and ask him to take interest in self-realization. He will say that he simply wants to work to satisfy his stomach and that there is no need of self-realization for a hungry man. The laws of nature are so cruel, however, that despite his denunciation of the need for self-realization and his eagerness to work hard to fill his stomach, he is always threatened by unemployment. We are given this human form of life not to work hard like asses, swine, and dogs, but to attain the highest perfection of life. If we do not care for self-realization, the laws of nature force us to work very hard, even though we may not want to do so. Human beings in this age have been forced to work hard like the asses and bullocks that pull carts. Some of the regions where the asuras are sent to work are revealed in this verse of Sri Ishapanishad. If a man fails to discharge his duties as a human being, he is forced to transmigrate to the asurya planets and take birth in degraded species of life to work hard in ignorance and darkness. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is stated that a man who enters upon the path of self-realization but does not complete the process despite having sincerely tried to realize his relationship with God, is given a chance to appear in a family of Suchi or Srimat. The word Suchi indicates a spiritually advanced Brahmin, and Srimat indicates a Vaisha, a member of the mercantile community. So the person who fails to achieve self-realization is given a better chance in his next life due to his sincere efforts in this life. If even a fallen candidate is given a chance to take birth in a respectable and noble family, one can hardly imagine the status of one who has achieved success. By simply attempting to realize God, one is guaranteed birth in a wealthy or aristocratic family. But those who do not even make an attempt, who want to be covered by illusion, who are too materialistic and too attached to material enjoyment, must enter into the darkest regions of hell, as confirmed throughout the Vedic literature. Such materialistic asuras sometimes make a show of religion, but their ultimate aim is material prosperity. The Bhagavad Gita rebukes such men by calling them atma sambhavita, meaning that they are considered great only on the strength of deception and are empowered by the votes of the ignorant and by their own material wealth. Such asuras, devoid of self-realization and knowledge of Ishavasya, the Lord's universal proprietorship, are certain to enter into the darkest regions. The conclusion is that as human beings, we are meant not simply for solving economic problems on a tottering platform, but for solving all the problems of the material life into which we have been placed by the laws of nature. Mantra 4. Although fixed in his abode, the personality of Godhead is swifter than the mind and can overcome all others running. The powerful demigods cannot approach him. Although in one place, he controls those who supply the air and rain. He surpasses all in excellence. Report. Through mental speculation, even the greatest philosopher cannot know the Supreme Lord who is the absolute personality of Godhead. He can be known only by his devotees through his mercy. In the Brahma Samhita, it is stated that even if a non-devotee philosopher travels through space at the speed of the wind or the mind for hundreds of millions of years, he will still find that the absolute truth is far, far away from him. <laughs> 